for next week, I am going to ask you to write one paragraph, short, and you know what? You can write this down, but you, when it, it's another art thing. Some of you really liked the Nero, picture of Nero, the, and so we have another artwork. And I think many of you, okay, I'm just stealing your book, Ethan. Uh, if you're both, oh yeah, uh, it's, the, it's actually the picture on the front cover. Um, my front cover has the whole picture, but I have printed out copies. It is called The Early Martyr's Last Prayer. I'm, I'm going to just hand these out because I know I have way more than I need and there's going to be a pile left over. Um, this was painted in 1883 by a French artist named Jérôme, or Jérôme. And um, it, it has a lot of detail. You can see, I, I'm sorry for the smallness, but your eyes are better than mine. Also, if you Google, if you Google the Church Martyrs Last Prayer, like this, I found this on the internet and I just printed it off for myself. Um, you can see it bigger um, and you can zoom in. But um, you, know, you can see, obviously, the lion and the group of martyrs praying. Um, but notice the torches all around them, the people on crosses, and some of them are burning. And, um, and of course, the lion is coming, but you notice down in the pit, in the lower left-hand corner, there's a tiger about to come. Um, here's what I'd like you to do. Last time, I asked you to, to kind of do an art analysis. You know, what, what kind of colors does the artist use? And why do you think? And what, what is the symbolic of? And that sort of thing. This time, I would like you to describe the scene. But I would like you to use as many sensory elements as you can. What did it sound like, smell like? feel like? What do you hear? What do you taste even? Um, you, you can be one of the martyrs. You can be in the stands. You can be a, a, an observer, a third party out of the picture observer. But this time, instead of saying, I see this and it's probably symbolic of that, why don't we just try to live in that moment for a paragraph and just describe what did they see, hear, feel, smell, taste, if it's applicable? Yeah, Ethan. You can you can definitely do it in poetic form. Absolutely. Yes, Alex. Does mental uh, like what were they thinking? Yes, mental, mental is fine. It does not have to be just the five senses. Uh, just a second, Kyle. So you have on a cross, it looks like a higher than the lion. So it looks like we are on a cross. Oh, that's a really good observation, Kyle. Perhaps we're at the other end of a semicircle of the crosses looking down. If you want to be that person, I think you're having a lot of sensory experience if you are, unfortunately. Yes, Simeon. Yes, you can. That's a great idea, too. The Christian Martyr's Last Prayer. And the artist is, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Jerome, G-E-R-O-M-E. G-E-R-O-M-E, -E. if you want to, to Google it. And it's obviously it's a very famous. My my, this is my copy of Eusebius, and it has the whole picture on the front. Yours has more of a. It's a the whole picture is there, but it's wrapped around. I think if you opened the whole book and looked at the front and the back. No, oh, no, it doesn't wrap around. I thought maybe the rest of it was on the back. Just asking for too much there. Does this does this assignment make sense to everyone? Just just like a summa, two hundred fifty to three hundred words, just a paragraph, just. You let your imagination, like Ethan said last time, you kind of had to regurgitate Justin's arguments for me. This time you get to use your imagination a little bit. Yeah. The lion looks like Scar. Do all lions look a little bit like Scar? If they're skinny? That's the question. 
If they're fat, they look like Mufasa. If they're skinny, they look like Scar. It's because I just don't know enough lions personally. I don't recognize them when I see them. Um, okay. Our art. I'm going to wait for the conversations to wind down. All right. Are we with me now? Yes. The, the sixth sense of, of spiritual perception or whatever. Um, okay. Our art of the week is painted inside one of the catacombs of Rome. Are we all familiar or have we heard of the catacombs? If we're not sure what the de what's the deal with we have Christians in the catacombs, we always hear this. Catacombs are hollowed out caves in the rock under the city, specifically under the city of Rome, that were used for burial. So, and by some of you might be familiar with Khan Academy. They have a lot of great videos. And if you Google the um, the Catacomb of Priscilla, uh, it, there's a video tour. Like they walk you through the Catacomb of Priscilla. It's pretty cool. It lasts about ten minutes. Anyway, um, in these in these chambers cut into the rock, sometimes it's a relatively biggish room, not big like this, but room size. Sometimes it's just a hallway. And on the sides, there are niches cut in the rock where you lay the body. And then, of course, you can't just fill a hole with dead bodies and not cover them because it will smell. So you brick it up. You brick it and, and plaster it. Maybe you might even plaster over the brick and then paint on it. Put an epitaph or paint pictures or things like this. And these were the burials. So the way they became associated with the Christians is because, first of all, many Christians were burying martyrs in the catacombs. And, and when they did so, as, as we read earlier um, in one of the fathers, we talked about this, I, I think, going to the grave to have your church service on the anniversary of their death. So what we would call their feast day. This, this is what a feast day of a saint is. It's the day of their death. Um, and, uh, and so we go because they're not dead. Their body is there, but they are not completely dead. We do not mourn as those who have no hope. And it reminds them that the church is the body of Christ. It does not say only the people living right now are the body of Christ. It says the church is. Some of that church is, is not living with us anymore. The guys were reading. Some of that church hasn't been born yet, but God knows them. And some of us are, we call it the, the church, we're the church militant. We're the fighting church. The church of the people who've died, they're the church triumphant. They're already there. They've, they've run their race. They've done their battle. And they've got their reward. Um, so they would meet in the catacombs. Sometimes also they would have services there because it was a very secret place. I don't know that there was a lot of herding Christians in the catacombs specifically to hide from the Romans. You kind of get the idea, Christians hiding in the catacombs. But they were having services there because nobody could see it. Um, it must have been a little creepy. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, you know, because there's no electric lights of any sort. There's just uh, lamps, torchlight, candles, and you're just completely under the ground. There's, there's no, no light whatsoever. Um, but they started painting them, and the, the pagan Romans did this too, all right? They would have, write epitaphs. They used these. These weren't just Christian burials. The Christians started burying their dead there and having services there, and when they did, they started painting specifically Christian things to identify that this person is, is a Christian. Um, some of them were a little bit coded, one of the less obvious codes is this week's. This is, what is this guy's day job? What does he do for a living? He's a shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Images of a shepherd were painted, statues um, in the catacombs, at Christian burials all over. And, and of course, to someone not acquainted with the Bible, not acquainted with Christianity, this wouldn't, oh, a shepherd guy. Isn't that charming? But Christians knew the code. He's the good shepherds. 
And um, so we're gonna, actually, this is not the only good shepherd we're going to look at, but this is one of the earliest. This is around the year 200. And this is in a catacomb of Priscilla. Priscilla was the lady who owned the house. <clears throat> and this was sort of like there was a door in her basement that led down to it. You went through her house downstairs. And then it just kept, it just kept spreading. I, I assume after Priscilla was no longer with us, Priscilla is buried there. Um, this is actually, you know, it's a circle. It's a, it's a dome. It's in the domed part. It's not a big dome, but it's a little a, a concave area. So this is, you look up, and the good shepherd is there above you. Um, other popular symbols were anchors, because uh, Christ is the anchor. We are anchored in him, and he's the anchor of our souls. And the one you're all familiar with, the fish, right? Do, do you know why? Why a fish? Okay, that's one, but there's 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 more. But wait, there's more. Do you know? Do you know, Alex? No, I thought you were asking about why they, they, why they do that extra. I don't know. Uh, ichthus. Ichthus is the Greek word for fish. And it happens to be an acronym for Jesus Christ. Theu, I'm not doing my, um, sorry. Um, we us, uh, oh, I think that's an omega. So tear, I'm not sure about that one. So tear. Um, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. What? Yeah, that's why the fish and fishers of men. That's totally true, too. Yes, on the back of cars and stuff. It all comes back to this. It's it's an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior in Greek. And so, but but see, people wouldn't know. They just see, oh, nice. Apparently they like fish, you know, for dinner. You know, why do they put a fish on their grave? This is why. And so people who are in on the code know the code. And uh, it's very cool. Yes, it's a code, and it's a code from the from the Greek phrase. So, uh, so we started um, seeing in the 100s, and now we're at 200, and we have full blown paintings. Um, and you know, it's not the greatest painting looking painting in the world, but honestly, they painted it on a ceiling in the dark by lamplight. I think they did pretty good, frankly. Um, <clears throat> And if you think about it, the fact that we're going to start looking at Christian art is a little bit startling because remember, the Jews were forbidden representational art. Make no image of, you know, things in heaven or creeping things on the earth. And they took this very literally. They did not do representational art. And Muslims still don't for the same reason. Um, but the Christian community grew out of this and they said, okay, we understand that for years God had forbidden this and we understand why, but he has now given us his image. Jesus is the true image of the father. Jesus has represented the father in the flesh and now we can do the same. We can artistically represent biblical subjects, people. And so even, uh, and I doubt that any of you, and it's, it's fine if you do, but ma many churches have some sort of art in them somewhere. You might not have it in the sanctuary, but somewhere there's a picture of Jesus, there's a painting of Jesus with the children or whatever, because there are very few, and it's, again, I'm not, we come from all different traditions, but I've, I've been around. I've been to a lot of different types of churches, and I don't think I've ever been to one that had zero representations anywhere in the church building, you know, in a Sunday school room or whatever. Um, and so, but, but, but this was a revolution. The idea, oh my goodness, we can portray biblical subjects. We can portray Jesus because 
Jesus has been portrayed. He's the portrayal of the Father. He's the manifestation in flesh and blood of the Father, and therefore we can do likewise. And this is the rationale um, for you know, statuary and paintings and all of Christian art, it, because there is no, there, Muslim art is geometrical designs, you know. Jewish art is, is also not representational. It's beautiful, but it's not representational like this because God said, don't make an image. And the early, the early father said, you know what? God superseded that because he made an image. <laughs> he himself did it. He sent his son. And um, anyway, so good shepherd. We will see more good shepherds, at least one more, I think, in the coming weeks. And I'll bring in some, some more some more early pictures of early Christian art. Um, let's take a look first at Eusebius. Um, this was a long, rather rambling book, I felt like. I don't know if you feel the same. Um, it was kind of hard to follow. He, it, 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 book six, this is book six. Um, the one, uh, Origin and Atrocities at Alexandria was the his name. I'm just gonna pull out the several most important things I wanna talk about. And we're just going to not touch the rest because it's just, there are a lot of topics and it's just confusing. Um, so I picked out the things that I thought were most important. Uh, the first thing is um, persecution at Alexandria in Egypt. Last week we talked about massive persecution in, in Gaul, in what is today southern France. Um, and Blandina, remember poor Blandina who just wouldn't die. Um, um, but there were also famous persecutions in North Africa. Um, Perpetua and Felicity are the most famous martyrs, which, interesting, Eusebius doesn't mention. Um, an older, I mean, a mom age woman and a, a young girl um, who, like Blandina, just were troopers and just torture and torture and torture. Um, uh, so, so, but these, remember, these are local outbreaks. And one of them happened at Alexandria. We hear, my glasses were on the head. I lost them. Um, hang on. Have I gone past it? See, this always happens when I try to go out of order, doesn't it? You guys are very patient. All right. I, for some reason, I could swear that I put a big yellow line down the side. Uh, if we find it, <clears throat> I will talk about it. Um, in this terrible persecution in Alexandria, one of the martyrs was named Leonides, known as the father of Origen, who was beheaded, Leonides was, leaving behind his young son, a lad very attuned to the divine word from early age. His life story would fill a whole book. We hear a lot of his life, if you noticed. And you might think, who is this guy? I've never even heard of this guy before. What is his story that he gets so much time in Eusebius's book? Origen was, from a very young age, really brilliant and really devoted to God. And uh, so the story is that when his dad was arrested, he not only really encouraged his dad not to, to, to curse Christ, not to sacrifice, which hopefully we would all encourage our loved ones not to do that. But he was so gung-ho that his mom had to restrain him and keep him at home. He wanted to run out and join him. He was a kid. His mom said, no, you're no. By the time he was 18, he was the head of the school at Alexandria. Eusebius calls it the catechetical school. So um, I don't know, you know what a catechumen is? A catechumen is someone who's studying in, before being baptized. So it's the training you get in Christianity before, so that you know, what is it I'm saying I believe, you know, when I get baptized. Um, and uh, so the catechetical school was theology, but it was also teaching grammar, logic, rhetoric. It was a school, school. And at 18, he was the head because he was so brilliant. A 
controversy swirled around him even during his life. Because sometimes when you're brilliant, it challenges people. Do you know what I mean? It, it, he's smarter than me and he gets all the glory and what about me? Okay, it, makes, it takes people off. But so he went, to, he went to Caesarea in Palestine and apparently they invited him to speak at the church, but he wasn't ordained a priest yet. And so people got mad. No, you're not, you're not qualified to speak in the church yet. And then they ordained him a priest. And then his bishop back in Alexandria got mad at him because it wasn't, he didn't go through the proper channels and this sort of thing. And people became upset with him. He also, I'm going to say it. Okay, I didn't say it yesterday. It was your high school. He, he took it very seriously when it said some have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. And apparently he operated on himself to eunuchize himself. Um, well, I don't know. Yes, to himself. Yes. Because he didn't want to, it to look um, suspicious because he worked with women often. And he just wanted all taint of suspicion to be gone. But a lot of people, I mean, nobody really then thinks this is a good idea. It's like origin, no. Like, no. That's messed up. Um, so even in his lifetime, people were like, Origen, he's over the edge. From things like this. And the fact that he didn't always follow the rules. Um, but there's more. But let Ethan chime in first. There's an issue about that. Um, the devil uses like, tools to get people to do things that so, one of the things that he has to do that because he works with women, yeah. that's not, that's, that's a human issue because we know we live in a world, but... Well, but in, in his defense, you know, it says that let, let there not even, okay, I'm vastly paraphrasing the scripture, let there not even be a hint of impropriety among you. Let there not be a hint of immorality among you. And so, you know, he thinks he's doing the right thing by just taking away all suspicion and also suspicion of these women. They might be counseling or teaching in private. Um, and we still do this, you know. Um, it, it's, we're told to be you know, innocent as doves, but wise as serpents. You know, we need, to, we need to be smart about the way we interact with people, who we're alone with, and what that looks like to others. But yet, you know, in, in an unfallen world, this would not be a problem, but it's our own sin that comes up. Anyway, so you can see from these examples, okay, origin was problematic. But he wrote, and Eusebius listed a lot. Did you see? There was just a page of the writings of Origen. Sort of, um, one church father said, you have to spend your whole life just studying Origen to read all his stuff he wrote. Um, and he started writing things like, okay, I'm going to vastly condense what he's teaching, but you'll get the idea. Um, our souls existed in heaven before we were born into bodies. And um, maybe some reason, some people are Christians and some people aren't, is because of bad things your soul did in the previous state. So reincarnation? No, because you don't get another chance. It's only one time through. It's just the souls existed first and had a life before they went into bodies. Before pre like a pre existence of souls, this is what we call it. Yeah, apparently, but but apparently, when we're born, we forget. Okay, it's sort of like the movie Soul, the Disney movie Soul, which is just not doing origin justice at all. But you know, they're they're existing and then they forget. Okay, so I'm not saying this is the church never thought this was right. Okay, but Origin started saying things like this. He also really started to feel like God would never condemn anyone to hell, so there's going to be universal salvation, including Satan. Yeah, that God will, that when it says God will bring all things into himself, that Jesus brings all things into himself and puts them, gives them to the Father, that all things, that bringing all things together, he meant literally all things. So, okay, so on the one side, I'm going to cut origin a little slack in this way. When the time Origen wrote, the creed, the Nicene Creed hadn't been written yet. There wasn't a hard and fast, this is the church's teaching on these subjects. 
And so Origen was just sort of letting his mind run and he was speculating. But right away, the church read these things. I mean, by right away, I mean not long after his death. They said, no, this is not, this is not church teaching. We want to make it very clear this is not what the church believes. And so he eventually, at a church council, he was declared a heretic for these heretical teachings. Even though he eventually um, was tortured, he was a martyr in the sense that he underwent the torture. They let him go, but he only lived a couple more years and he died from the lingering effects of the torture. So he, he was a martyr um, and a brilliant man and a brilliant teacher. And as far as we can tell, loved God with all his heart, but he just let his speculations run wild. And so the church had to, had to distance themselves. Does that make sense to everybody? And declare that this teaching is outside the teachings of the church. Um, I am reading in the mornings, I read church fathers. And right now I'm reading a series of letters between a guy named Rufinus and St. Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin. And they're arguing because Rufinus translated a book of origin. And Jerome is saying, he's a dirty, rotten heretic, and you're leading people astray. And But you left out some of the stuff, the heretical stuff that he said. And Rufinus answered back, and he said, well, Jerome, I don't know. Here it says in your writings that Origen was a brilliant teacher and blah, blah, blah. Are you reneging on that now? And <clears throat> yeah, so you get the idea. Uh, but they're, all, they're fighting over even translating a book of Origen into Latin for a Western audience um, because people just really wanted to distance themselves. But at the time, people saw him as a great teacher, brilliant man. Alexandria was the home of one of the two schools of theology that springs up in the 200s, 300s, 400s. And Alexandria always had a little, they were very speculative, very imaginative. And the other school was at Antioch and they were very literal and very, you know, and they kind of balanced each other, you know. So Origen grew up in that environment of, we just like to speculate about things we don't know. The only thing I can really compare it to today is I'm pretty safe, I think I'm safe in saying that there's no defined Christian teaching in any tradition of how we interpret revelation or what exactly will happen in the end times. So we're all, you know, we don't, if somebody says, I'm not sure that that thousand years is a literal thousand years on earth, we don't run away from them and say, that's a heretical, horrible teaching and the church doesn't, teach. There, there is no teaching on that. We don't know. We just don't know. And so no one has made a creed that, you know, so what does the creed say? We, we believe he'll come back. We believe he'll come back and we limit it to that and, and to judge the living and the dead. This is all we really know. And everything else is speculative. And Origen was kind of operating in that. Well, I feel like this is an area I can speculate on. But later church fathers said, no, Origen, that's not an area you can speculate on. We disagree. Yes. Yes, yes. We so we we just don't know, and I feel like that's the the best thing I can compare it to is those speculative things that no church really definitively. Some of some branches of Christianity feel very strongly about a certain version, but I don't think any of them would make it a statement of faith. You know, you have to believe it's going to go down this particular way or you're not really a Christian. I don't think there's anybody that does that. Um, and, and the church hadn't done that about these things yet. Okay, back to the Alexandria uh, persecution. Um, we met, I just thought this was a fascinating story, so I'm going to mention it. The famous girl with a really long name, Pata Mie, Miena. Patamiena, I'm going to go with that. Praises of this woman resound to this day among her people. Because of her beauty of mind and body, uh, she was had to content, struggle continually with lovers in defense of her chastity and virginity, which were above reproach. After sufferings too terrible to describe, she and her mother Marcella were fulfilled by fire. A soldier named Basilides led her off to a execution. But as the crowd cried, sorry, as the crowd tried to harass and insult her with obscenities, 
he pushed them back and drove them off, showing extreme pity and kindness to her. She accepted his sympathy and encouraged him, promising to ask her Lord for him after her departure. And before long, she would repay him for all he had done in her behalf. Having said this, she endured her in nobly when boiling tar was poured slowly, drop by drop, over various parts of her body from head to toe. Such was the contest won by this splendid girl. Not long afterward, one of the, his fellow soldiers asked Basilides for some reason to take an oath. But he maintained that swearing was absolutely forbidden to him as a Christian, confessing it openly. At first, they thought he was joking. But when he continued to affirm it, they brought him before the judge who sent him to prison when he, where he confirmed his beliefs. His brothers in God visited him and asked the reason for this sudden incredible inclination. And he is reported to have said that three days after her martyrdom, Potamiena appeared to him at night, wreathed his head with a crown and said that she had prayed the Lord for him and had obtained her request and before long would take him to herself. They say that many others at Alexandria suddenly came to Christ at this time because she appeared to them in dreams and invited them. I love this. It reminds us, our loved ones aren't dead. They, they continue to exist. I mean, you can like dead people visiting you in dreams or not. You know, I'm not making a comment on that. But it certainly reminds us that, that these people continue to live. All the, all the, well, I was going to say all the Christians, unfortunately, all the people you've ever known that have passed on still exist. Still exist in a conscious state. Those exist forever. It's just that their body stopped working. I love it. I love it. Um, so in some, in some Christian traditions, maybe not so much in this room, but in some Christian traditions, people uh, uh, converse with their dead loved ones, uh, I would say, ask them to pray for us. Um, and, and the idea is just as I might ask my brother to pray for me, who's alive, I might ask my grandma to pray for me, who's not alive anymore. Um, and presumably better able to pray for me because she's not so busy with living. You know, she's run the course. And that's, and that's the idea behind that. But the, the base idea is that these people still are alive, all right? And they're still the body of Christ. They're still the church. They're just not here anymore like we talked about with the, with the catacombs. Um, okay. Philip. Philip the Arab, the emperor, just going to throw this in because Eusebius says, word has it that he was a Christian and wanted to join with believers in the prayers of the church on the day of the last Easter vigil. But the prelate of the time would not let him enter until he confessed publicly and joined those who were judged sinful and occupying the place in church for penitence. Um, he wanted to come to the Easter Eve service, but he hadn't really made a public confession of faith and they wouldn't let him. Um, intriguing. Maybe he was the first Christian emperor. But the most important emperor you read about is Decius. All right? And it says, after the reign of seven years, Philip was succeeded by Decius. Because of his hostility to Philip, who may have been a Christian, he began a persecution against the churches. This is one of the major persecutions of the Roman Empire, the Decian persecution. You know, I told you, all these little, you know, I was going to say fires breaking out, sometimes literally fires breaking out, uh, persecutions breaking out locally. But Decius said, we are rounding you all up and killing you. We are hunting you down. Now, you might say, well, all to spite Philip, who was maybe a Christian, not all. Now, I have asked you guys, and I don't know if you've been doing it because we haven't really talked about it. I pointed out to you that at the end of every chapter, 
there is a section written by the editor talking about what's happening in Roman history at the time. And this one I really want to point out because it's kind of important to know why this persecution is breaking out at this time. So do you remember last week, the lovely family portrait with the little boy's face rubbed out? How could we forget? Um, the other little boy, Caracalla, um, is the first one mentioned here in the back of this chapter. Caracalla, Severus's son and successor, ended a fierce rivalry with his brother Geta by stabbing him to death in their mother's arms. The rest of his rule was more statesmanlike, but during a campaign in the east, Caracalla was assassinated by the Praetorian prefect Macrinus. Macrinus, 217 to 218 is his ruling years. Does this tell you something? Caracalla was 211 to 217. Now we have 217 to 218. Macrinus tried to legitimize his usurpation by winning military glory against the Parthians. Instead, they defeated him after which he was captured and killed by troops loyal to the Severan dynasty, which was now restored. They brought in Septimius Severus's family. Eleogobulus, 218 to 222, four years. Rumored to be the natural son of Caracalla, <clears throat> had been high priest of Elagabal, the Syrian sun god. And the young teenager now arrived in Rome wearing silk, a pearl necklace, and rouged cheeks. Well, isn't he a character? Um, a grotesquely colorful sort on the model of Caligula, he tried to make Elagabal supreme in Rome, the sun god. But his idiotic, depraved conduct and surrender to total debauchery led his grandmother and aunt to arrange his assassination while he was hiding in a latrine. When your grandma hires a hitman that chases you into the bathroom, you're a bad sort. Alexander Severus, he gets um, uh, 13 years. Uh, his cousin and successor brought sobriety back to the Roman government. It goes on and on about all the things he did. Um, but when he was on the German frontier, Alexander's legions mutinied and murdered both him and his mother. Now, listen to this. You get the picture. We have many emperors in quick succession, some of them kind of weird. This also marked the beginning of the horrendous period for the Roman Empire, which was torn by a half century of civil war in the years between 235 and 284, 49 years, there were 20 emperors, many of whom reigned only months before being assassinated. And he gives a list in the back of your chapter here of all these, and it says, yet even this list is misleading, since it includes only those 20 emperors recognized by the Senate, most of whom had rivals backed by strong armies. This isn't even the guys whose armies proclaimed them emperor. These are just guys the Senate gave their seal of approval to. Okay, now, why do I mention this? Oh, and the, actually, there's more mess I need to mention first. Not only is emperor after emperor after emperor coming and going during this time, but there's mass inflation. The emperors are short on cash because they're fighting a lot of wars. And what do they do when sometimes you're short of cash? You do what is called, you make more or you debase the currency. So those coins that used to be all silver, they're not all silver anymore. They're lead with a little bit of silver wrapped around, you know, painted on it. And everybody knows it. And so you used to give me five pieces of silver, Ethan, for, I don't know, a bottle of water. Seems like pretty stiff. Apparently there's a drought. Um, you know, but I know your silver isn't really silver anymore. I'm like, no, you can give me 10. You can give me 12. You can give me 15. Because these aren't worth anything. All right, do you see how the prices go up? Emperor after emperor debased the coinage till it was just, it had no intrinsic worth. Do you know, like, it's sort of like paper. Our paper money has no, paper isn't worth anything. Do you know what I mean? It's only worth it because the government says we have at Fort Knox or wherever gold to back this up, you know. Um, but in itself, it's not worth anything. So the coins came to be the fact that it wasn't really worth anything anymore. Why do they need money? Why are they fighting wars all the time? Because the empire is being pounded. Okay, I already, I did this yesterday, I did it again today. I rolled my 
map up. All right, got to do the pretend map. It's the pretend map of the Mediterranean. Got it? All right, Italy's here. Greece is here. First, over here, Parthia. The Parthians, these guys that killed Crassus and poured molten gold down his throat, remember? Um, they're being pushed by people coming from farther east, Persians. They call them Persians. I don't know if they're related to the Persian Persians, you know, like the, that attack Greece, or if this is a new group and we just call them Persians. Anyway, whoever they are, they're pushing. And so there's fighting. There's fighting on this frontier. Up here, we have a group called the Goths. And they're coming from the east, and they're hitting northern Greece right now. They're going to hit the rest of Europe in a couple of hundred years. But right now, they're pounding Macedonia. They're pounding Thrace. And then we have more people. All these people come from the east. Um, Franks. The Franks are working their way towards Gaul, where eventually they're going to settle and name it France after the Franks. That's why we call it France. Where they are everywhere. They are mostly in the cities, but it's spreading into the countryside. They are mostly around the Mediterranean, and they are not yet in northern Gaul and Britain, although there might be a few here and there. Mostly they're hugging, they're hugging the Mediterranean Sea, Alex, um, and they're mostly in the cities. Someone in the junior high, we were talking about pagans. I think I told you this. Pagan is the Latin word for somebody who lives in the country. Paganus is a country dweller. Because Christianity spread first in the cities where people live close to each other. It took a long time before the countryside was Christianized. They tended to be more conservative. We like the old ways. We do it the old way my Grandpa did it, you know, out here on the farm. So does that, is that kind of what you were asking? Where, where are they? Um, but, but they're suffering all the problems along with everybody else in the empire, right? They're suffering from inflation. They're suffering. Um, it, it, there was some, sometimes some Christians said, no, I can't serve in the army because it's wrong. Some said, I see nothing wrong with defending my homeland. The only problem was often you were forced to worship Caesar to be in the army. So... Not at this time, not so many Christians in the army because it, it conflicted with their conscience. Just the the fact that they 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 might be willing to defend Rome, but they're not willing to to sacrifice. Um, yeah. Yes, and that's very good. You said that very well. On top of all of this, they're being persecuted. Okay, so now, it seems like I've had a really long digression, but it had a point. Let's go back to the Decian persecution. The, this is the first time that people start saying something that they're going to say for the next couple of hundred years. And it is this. Roman Empire was fine before those Christians came along. I don't know what... You know, like they disked the gods. That's what happened. They disrespected the gods, and now the gods are punishing Rome. We need to round those guys up and get rid of them because they are a plague on our existence. Do you see the connection? When we worshipped Zeus or Jupiter, everything was fine. When we didn't have a large population that refused to do this, everything was fine. And these guys started popping up. And all these bad things started happening to us. Yes, because they're they're very blamable. Do you know what I mean? Because they tended to, yeah, they were very countercultural, but they were humble. They didn't fight back. They didn't fight back. I mean, they had their apologists that are that are fighting back, so to speak. But yes, cards. Yes, yes. And, and some, some Christians did point this out. You know, could it be that you're persecuting us? In fact, I believe in next week's reading, Eusebius is going to mention something to that effect. Um, so, so can you get a picture of the Roman Empire is going down the toilet. 
and we think the Christians are to blame. So Decius says, let's round them up empire-wide and punish them. And this is what they started doing. Oh, you know what? I think that's where, this is where my thing is that I was looking for earlier, and I thought it was in Alexandria. Um, I'm going to just go back. Um, it is. It is in Alexandria, but it's under the Decian persecution. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this long section. Uh, this was written by Dionysius. Did you notice we just kept quoting him left and right? The, the bishop Dionysius. Apparently, Eusebius really, really liked to quote him. He doesn't really tell us much about him, but he just uses his writings. This is what he wrote about the full-fledged persecution by Decius. No road. Um, I'm, oh, I don't, my page numbers aren't going to be the same. 236 is my page. I don't think they're the same. I suppose they could be. No road, no highway, no alley could we use either by night or day. Everywhere there was shouting that whoever did not join in the chorus of blasphemy must be dragged off and burned. This state of affairs continued long and intense, but discord and civil war overtook these wretched men, turning on themselves the fury they aimed at us. For a brief period, we could breathe again, since they had no time to vent their fury against us, but soon the news came of the change from the rain that had been kinder to us. That's Philip. You're saying, okay, there, there had been terrible persecution, and we got a breathing space under Philip. Then there was a change of administration. The edict arrived indeed, almost like that predicted by our Lord in his fearful words, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. All cringed in terror. Some of the better known immediately came forward through fear. Others in public positions did so for professional reasons, and still others were dragged out by bystanders. Called up by name, they approached the unclean, unholy sacrifices, some pale and trembling, as if they were not going to do sacrifice, but be sacrificed as victims to the idols, evoking mockery from the surrounding crowd. And it was obvious that they were total cowards, afraid to die and afraid to sacrifice. Others, however, ran to the altars eagerly, as if to show they had never been Christians. Concerning these, the Lord had truly predicted that they would be saved only with difficulty. Of the rest, some followed one or another of these groups, while others fled. Some were captured and imprisoned, of whom some, after long incarceration, renounced their faith, even before coming into court, while others endured torture for a while before giving in. If you give in, they give you a certificate. And I, I put one of these certificates in your, in your book. Yes. So in, on the next page, it says, to those superintending the sacrifices of the village of Theodelphia from Aurelia Bellius, this is on page 78, daughter of Petteris and her daughter Capinus. We have sacrificed to the gods all along. And now in your presence, according to orders, I poured a libation and sacrificed and tasted of the sacred offerings. And I request you to subscribe this for us. And the, and the official in charge signs it. And you've got to get out of jail free card. I did it. I did it. If anybody, I, are you one of those Christians? These are my credentials. I did it. And so this is what you get if you do it, but there was a group, there was a movement to buy them, buy a certificate, forged, you see? So worst, worst thing you could possibly do is deny Christ and sacrifice and get a certificate. <clears throat> next on the scale, however, is, um, next on the scale is, yeah, I, I bought a forged document to make it look like I did, which is lying. Now, persecution doesn't go on forever because Decius doesn't live forever. And when they're done, they have a problem. And this is the only question I asked you in your reading guide from book six. What belief of novatus or novation led to a schism in the church? Novation said something about these, we call them the lapsed, okay? They fell. Here is what 
the problem is. All right. Eusebius says, even the divine martyrs among us who are now Christ's assessors and share his authority have taken up the cause of their fallen brethren. Remember, fallen doesn't mean dead. It's lapsed. They have a certificate. Their conversion and repentance they judged acceptable to him who has no pleasure in the death of the sinner, but rather his repentance. So they received and readmitted them to the congregation. And this is, in a, I'm quoting a letter here from Dionysius. Shall we share their opinion and deal mercifully with those they pitied? Or shall we regard their decision as unjust and overturn their practice? These guys are welcoming the lapsed back into the church, to the Eucharist. If they say, I, I sinned, I'm sorry, I was wrong. But Novation, a presbyter of the Roman church, had contempt for them. They no longer had any hope of salvation, not in, even if they did everything demanded in a genuine confession and conversion. He became leader of a new sect whose members pridefully called themselves the pure. In response, a large synod convened at Rome, attended by 60 bishops and an even greater number of presbyters and deacons. While in the province, provinces, the local clergy separately considered what was to be done. It was decreed unanimously that Novatus and his companions in arrogance and all who supported his hatred and inhumanity to the brethren should be considered outside the church, but that those brothers who had fallen should be treated and restored with the medicine of repentance. This was a big decision the church had to make. What do we do with these people? They cursed Christ and gave incense to Caesar. And now they come knocking on the church door and saying, we're so sorry. We sinned. Please forgive us. And, and many churches are like, you're right. You did sin. And th th this, this is a little foreign to many Christian traditions today, but the whole early church was like this. You did not just go and say, I'm sorry, I sinned. Great. God forgives you. It was, you had to prove it. There was a period of time where you were not admitted to communion where you were, there was a certain area of the church, like those are the penitents. Like you came and you confessed, you murder. Okay, but you're going to have a time of penitence. Just, you're going to have to prove that you really mean it. We don't want you flip-flopping. And so they admitted these people into the penitence section. But Novation's like, no, they blew it, and there is no second chance. There is no coming back from this. They've denied Jesus, done. They might just throw him out. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Very. Yes. Except, except this case, it's not predestined. But, but yeah. But it's, but it's. No. You're. You are out. You are outside the fold, and there is no getting back in. And so, and it what? And so, you know. So they said so the pure. We're the pure. And the and the church had to make a decision, and their decision was, you can't just set up your own church even if there is corruption in the church you got. You can't just set up your own church. That was what they ruled. Novation can't have the church of Novation, the pure church of Novation, no. Even if there are sinners in the existing church, you can't set up your own church. And they set up what Augustine, who we're going to read in April, uh, the idea that the church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for the saints. He didn't use the term country club. I am now paraphrasing Augustine. Hospital for sinners, though, was thanks. Um, yeah, it was, it was the first, it wasn't the first break off. You know, these crazy Gnostics were all over the place. But it was the first time people totally orthodox in belief. You know what I mean? Like, they believe all the, like, they're not Gnostics, but they just look at the church. The church, church is full of dirty, rotten sinners, and we're going to set up our own church here, and they're going to be, it's going to be the pure church, and you guys can't come in. And the church shot that down with a resounding no. No. Well, it's not, it's not elite. I don't think elitist maybe is the right term for it, Ethan. Um, that makes it sound like they're shutting people out because 
They, well, okay. They are because they're special. When I think of elitist, it's I've, I've made myself special. In their case, God has made them special, but it's still viewing themselves as a special group. So I guess I'll take that. That's exactly what he's. That's exactly what he's saying. Yes. Um. To to give him a little. I always feel like I have to cut these people a little bit of slack because we want to slam them because we don't know what it was like. There was the whole the whole first several hundred years of the church. A lot of church fathers write as if. There are many sins you just can't come back from. They weren't sure. Um, there were things, there were some parishes, some church groups that if you did certain things, they would let you come back in, but you may not ever get to take communion again until deathbed. Um, they may just, uh, you know, murder, adultery, or, you know, really, really uh, egregious sins. Um, there, there, was a, there was a level of strictness that wasn't followed universally, but, but often was writings or it's written like you weren't allowed ever to take communion again after this. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't pursue that any further. But, but in this case, the church even then roundly condemned this idea. Um, yes. All right, let's, we've got about, I don't know, 25 minutes left. Let's look at Irenaeus um, his, against heresies. I didn't ask you tons of questions about this. I'll try just to hit the highlights here. Um, it, how did you, was this a more readable, more enjoyable, less enjoyable, easy to follow, except not the crazy stuff about the Gnostics. That's not easy to follow at all. What? Um, we only get some excerpts in this, this particular book and from book one, book three, and book five of a much longer work. And book one, he, he called, the title that they've given it is The Heretics. But I want to point out to you the actual name of the entire work that he wrote. That We just call it Against Heresies. But it's called The Refutation and Overthrow of the Knowledge Falsely So-Called. That's the title. It's a very long title. Against Heresies is much quicker to say. Easier to write. Uh, so he... Each section of this longer work where he's going to refute and overthrow knowledge, gnosis, it's the Greek word for knowledge, falsely so-called, the Gnostics. And the first question I asked you from book one, it's the only question I asked you from book one, how do the Gnostic heretics attract people to their teachings? What do they do, Alex? Like the wolfish sheep's clothing um, deal. Like yes. Like That's a very good analogy. Simeon, were you going to say something too? Okay. Um, he, they do this in two ways, the, the decking it out. First of all, Irene says this. It is craftily decked out in an attractive dress and made to seem truer than the truth itself to the inexperienced because of the outer appearance. Now, I will, I'll just ask you, how do you make a teaching look pretty? You can't dress it up in a prom dress, yes. By giving people what they want to hear. Okay, what do you think people want to hear? <clears throat> okay, maybe we try to sound more intelligent than we really are. Okay. Okay. So maybe the uh, sort of a like the modern prosperity gospel that if you're a good Christian you'll be rich, but but not but I don't think they're promising riches. If you're one of us, you'll be on the in crowd. Yeah. You'll be one of the special ones. You'll be the intelligentsia, the academia. Yeah, maybe I so. See. 
and I was trying to look for the uh, paragraph, but you have the um, the different arches. Um, let's see, the first pro arch. Yes. Uh, inconceivable, um, ineffable, invisible. It's really they're, they're, you can see they're trying to seem intelligent. They're making all of this up. Yes. So that they seem, I mean, it's the whole basis of the religion mm -hmm. to be intelligent and to know something that nobody else knows. Yes. I have a question. Yes. What would have happened if everyone had been agnostic? Then everyone would have been on the in crowd and there would have been no out crowd. Would they this have is been true. added on a new part of their religion? Possibly. I think so. Fortunately, God could not let that happen because he will never the gates of hell will never prevail against it you know there will always be a christian till jesus comes again um so definitely that like that um Irenaeus also says this because they talk like us though thinking very differently sometimes i mean that what you just read is not talking like them but they use buzzwords jesus salvation heaven you know they use the buzzwords but they don't mean what Christians mean by them, right? Um, so, um, like, uh, example is coming to mind is deists. You know, the deists, the, the enlightenment, um, the idea that God just winds up the world and lets it go and he's not really involved in human affairs. But they'll talk about providence. They'll talk about God, but they don't mean the same thing by those terms. The Gnostics were doing this. They were co-opting Christian terminology, but they didn't, when they said salvation, when they said redemption, they didn't really mean the same thing. But it's, it makes it look nice, right? It makes it, see, we're Christ, see, we're one of the, we're Christians, we're good people. And they dressed it up. does look appetizing, and this is one of those um, examples of it, it will, and like, sin does look little, and always would look like fun, but mm -hmm. it's like, only like, it's only like for like, slime last time. Yes, yes. It's, but with God, um, you'll, you'll enjoy forever. Yes. Um, those of you who did Socrates and Plato with me last year, you know, we talked about, you know, Socrates' idea that we choose stuff that is attractive to us. We, we don't, we just, we choose the wrong things. And this is a very Christian idea. Our loves are disordered, uh, Augustine would say. But yes, so uh, another thing these people do is um, they, um, uh, he says, change the basic idea. Irenaeus says, look. This is what the church believes. He goes along, I wrote creed next to it. It sounds like, it sounds like the Nicene or the Apostles' Creed he wrote. And he said, the church carefully preserves this as if living in one house. We know where our teaching came from. Because Irenaeus got taught by Polycarp and Polycarp got taught by the Apostle John. We know those lists of bishops in all the cities. We, we know where our teaching came from. You guys, on the other hand, Marcion, Serdon, they're just latecomers. They're newcomers. Um, you, you can't tell us where your teaching came before that. He made it up. We have preserved it, however. Um, he says, I'm going to skip that. Each of these mystagogues has his own ceremony of redemption. They have their own rites and ceremonies, which might look a little like baptism, but not quite. He says at one point, I don't know where it was, that they, instead of using the oil, so at that time, and in some Christian traditions today, you are anointed with chrism, with the, the holy oil, you know, after baptism or at confirmation. Um, and he's like, well, they say, oh, we don't need oil. We'll use this instead. We don't like oil, oil stuff, you know, it's so hard to rub off. We'll use something else. I mean, we don't even need that. We don't really need to use material things. It's all in your spirit, you know. So he says they they twist, they twist, but still, but it still 
smells like a Christian ceremony, sort of. Do you know what I mean? If you came in off the street, it's like, oh, it's just kind of like what the Christians do. They change it enough to do their own thing, but not enough that it's completely foreign. Does that make sense? Yes, this is exactly what they do. They're just going to change a couple things. What did you want to say, Alex? Um, wait, so are we saying it's heretical but not in No, we're, we're say, well, we're saying that um, at the time it was, it was the, the practice of all the churches was to do this and say, we're just, we're just not going to do that. We just don't, for no reason, because we want to do it differently. Um, I don't know if anyone would have said it was heretical. I don't think it was ever a question except for these guys. This is what you did. Any more than, um, you know, if, if someone stood up and, well, I guess this would be heretical. So he said, we just don't baptize anymore. We just, 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 just make a profession of faith. We don't, the water thing, we don't need to do the water thing anymore. I think this was the equivalent of doing something like that at that time. Does that make sense to you? If some group just said, you know, water is a material thing. And Jesus came to save our spirits. So no, that's just a misunderstanding of what he intended to use actual water. Like, no, we use actual water. Yes. I actually read, sorry, I'm going to digress, but I'm going to chime in on what Ethan said. I actually got read to me part of a bulletin from a funeral of a universalist funeral, and they like gave prayers to the sun and the moon and stuff. It was very weird. <laughs> I just I throw that in. Um, okay, we're going back. I, I love just throwing those things out to you guys, and then just, and now in other news. Um, uh, he says about the rights, about the oil and things, others omit all these things, saying they should not be performed by means of visible and corruptible things. All right, and then the last thing I want to point on book one is Irenaeus uses major sarcasm. I don't know if you noticed. He said, they're just making up these stupid names. All the Ogdoad, the eight, and the Tetrad, the four, and the... You know, all these things that, that, that Alex was reading about in the eons and the pleroma. Just so making this up. So he says, there's no reason why someone else shouldn't assign names like these on the same basis. There was a, there is a royal pro-arch above all thought, a power above all substance, ex indefinitely extended. This is the power which I call the gourd. With it, there is the power which I call super emptiness. <laughs> This gourd and super emptiness being uh, once emitted, yet did not emit the fruit, visible, edible, and delicious, which is known to language as the cucumber. And then he calls them the melon, and he's just making stuff up. He's poking fun at them. And I just wondered if you guys had thoughts on the use of sarcasm in apologetics. Oh, this, I mean, we cannot, I, I shouldn't even throw this out here because we don't, we so d don't have, you know, all day. But you know what I mean. We're poking fun. We're intentionally, scathingly poking fun at our opponent to bring them to a realization of the truth. That's an important part, that in part, okay? Yes. It is what he's trying to say. But what, okay, so what if I argue with it, Ethan? But it's so mean. But Christians are just supposed to love people, Ethan, and being sarcastic and We're poking fun at someone is just mean and shaming them. Christians are also supposed to be supposed to share the truth. And this is not true. Therefore, you, you, you entice this upon yourself. It is towing the line. It is definitely towing the line. It is sarcasm. Okay, Shh. let's do one at a time. Is sarcasm line? No. No. Then why are you saying it's a lie? 
because uh, it, it can come across as mean. It's not a lie, but it can come across as very mean, I think, is more the issue. Uh, if you need rude, which is the last thing, like it's towing the line, if you're helping them to see truth, it's kind of, you have an excuse, but you should really be making an excuse for being rude. So, like using sarcasm with, with a different religion, like, and they totally believe this, and like, or I can just it. worship the ground because it's part of everything. And so, like, going to the extremes and like, like, what they technically don't do it, and but going to the extremes and then just like being sarcastic about it and to make a point. Okay. Yeah, Alex, what you chime in. <clears throat> Maybe be sarcastic toward the idea rather than the person. That's what God calls us to be paid to sin and not Okay. Sin. So um, the person, no matter how wrong or stupid their beliefs are, uh, God still loves them. And I'm pretty sure that even God would infuse uh, sarcasm. Is there any sarcasm at all in the Bible? In the chosen uh, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, it, I, this is, okay, this is edging towards being a little sarcastic. You know, the, when he talks about the one person takes the, some material and he makes a, you know, a bowl out of it and then he makes an idol out of the rest and he bows down to it. That's, we're, we're skirting the edge of being a little sarcastic that, you know, it's the same wood, you yeah, know. That's good. That's, that's good. All right, say it. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yell, yell louder. Maybe he's on vacation. Yell louder. That's very sarcastic. Good job. Um, it, it, were you done? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it, there's a beautiful piece of, sarc it's not very beautiful at all. Uh, Jonathan Swift is the author of Gulliver's Travels, and he he wrote a, a, a you know, the, the Irish were in a terrible way, mostly because of the English. Uh, the English had conquered Ireland. The English had enforced Protestantism on Catholic Ireland, had taken away their lands, uh, had given them, uh, taken away their means of supporting themselves, and then wondered why they were starving to death. And so Jonathan Swift, who was stationed in Ireland, he was in Dublin at the time, wrote a, a scathing essay called A Modest Proposal. And he said, oh, you know, I know, I don't understand these Irish either. You know, I just, you know here's the, it, it's, it's a crazy problem. Here's the, here's the solution. We, they just keep having children, you know. We should just start fattening them up and eating them. That's what his essay is about. He's like a two-year-old would be the equivalent of a, a good Thanksgiving turkey. He didn't say Thanksgiving turkey because there's a Thanksgiving, but that was the equivalent. You know, a two-year-old would feed eight easy at dinner. Um, and of course, he did not mean this at all. He was poking fun at the idiot English who were asking themselves, why are the Irish always so troublesome? Why are they starving to death now? Because of all your policies. You've ruined Ireland. And so uh, sarcasm can be useful. I just, it struck me as kind of funny that Irenaeus put that in. And I just, yeah, but that was very well done. Elijah is very sarcastic to the priests of Baal. Love, love Mount Carmel. Okay, book three. We didn't get to hear book two in this particular edition, but Irenaeus tells us, in the first book, I gave you the opinions of all of them. That's what you read. In the second, their evil teachings are destroyed and overthrown. So he meets them on a logical basis. We don't have that book. In the third book, I introduce arguments from scriptures. And the question I asked you was, why does Irenaeus believe that the church has true the true teachings? Why do they have it and the Gnostics don't? Why does Irenaeus think that's true? Go ahead. We know exactly where they came from. He says, they, the apostles, first preached it abroad, then later by the will of God handed it down to us in writings. 
each of them equally being in possession of the gospel of God. They, they all have the truth because they're taught by Jesus himself, all right? Um, and then he goes on the writings of the four, our four scriptural gospels. Um, okay, let me skip down. When we appeal, when we appeal again to that tradition which has come down from the apostles and is guarded by the successions of the elders in the churches, here you see this keeps giving us those successions of the elders, they oppose the tradition, saying that they are wiser, not only than the elders, but even than the apostles, and have found the genuine truth. They didn't really understand what Jesus said. We understand. We have discovered the truth. Um, what it comes to is that they will not agree with either scripture or tradition. The tradition of the apostles made clear in all the world can be clearly seen in every church. We can enumerate the bishops and their successors down to our time, none of whom taught or thought anything like their mad ideas, he says. And then he gives Rome as an example. Look at this church. We know all the bishops. We know what they've taught. It, he says uh, some of these people still had their preaching, the apostles' teaching, sounding in their ears and his tradition before their eyes. He says something a little bit startling. Even if the apostles had not left their writings to us, ought we not to follow the rule of the tradition which they handed down to those whom they committed the churches? Even if we didn't have it written down in the Bible, we would still have the teachings. You were taught by this guy. You were taught by this guy. You were taught by this guy. It's plain you can walk into any Christian church and this is what they're teaching. You Gnostics though, you're doing it on the side, making stuff up. You have no tradition. You have no writings, you have no tradition. You have Marcion or Valentinus or whoever who just popped on the scene um, like uh, Joseph Smith, Mormonism, founder of Mormonism. You know, where does Mormonism come from? The 1800s. But they suddenly, they suddenly discovered the truth in the 1800s. Good for them. It's a similar just a larger period of time has passed. This is his argument um, that we have the truth because, um, because it's been passed down. Um, just a second, before I move on to book, actually there is another question. Oh, I want to talk about that. Why does Irenaeus believe there needed to be exactly four gospels? Not three, not five. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Why? What's special about four? I think each one gives a different perspective on the way of, of, of the of lives of the people. And if you had another one, you wouldn't have another second, they would overlap. And if you had one, one class, they wouldn't give enough information. Okay, so to fulfill a full picture, yes. would, would you say that? To fulfill a full picture of the events. Did anybody else find any, any other reasons that he gives? Okay, let me read it. The Gospels, because I love this. The Gospels could not possibly be either more or less in number than they are. Since there are four zones of the world in which we live, north, south, east, and west, four principal winds, the church is spread over all the earth. The pillar and foundation of the church is the Gospel. It fittingly has four pillars. The gospel fourfold in form held together by one spirit. So the first thing he says is we see fours in nature. The four, the four seasons, the four directions, the four prevailing winds. It is, it is right that this new, new institution, this new covenant that has come into the world be based on four. Then he bases it on something else. For the cherubim have four faces in Ezekiel, and their faces are images of the activity of the Son of God. For the first living creature, it says, was like a lion, signifying his active and princely and royal character. The second was like an ox, showing his sacrificial and priestly order. The third had the face of a man, indicating very clearly his coming in human guise. And the fourth was like a flying eagle, making plain the giving of the spirit 
who broods over the church. Now the gospels in which Christ is enthroned are like these, for that according to John expounds his princely and mighty and glorious birth. Uh, that according to Luke, having priestly character begins with the priest Zacharias, offering incense to God. Matthew proclaims his human birth, saying the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. But Mark takes his beginning from the prophetic spirit that comes on men from on high, saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, showing a winged image of the gospel. This is the first time that one of the church fathers brought in something that is going to last for a millennium or more. Um, the idea that the gospels correspond to the four living creatures of Ezekiel. Only he has John and um, Mark opposite. Later it was John was the eagle, the lofty in the beginning was the word, and Mark was the lion, um, the kingly. Um, and so I brought to show you, this is um, a journal that my daughter bought me. Um, it's This is from the book of Kells. All right, I'll leave it. You can come up and see it when we're done. We only have a couple minutes left. And it's the, it's, this is the preface. What is it? It's the, um, oh, where is it? Okay, this is the cover of the gospel, according to Mark, symbolizing the four evangelists. Um, we have a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, but it's very stylized. Every time anyone in the Middle Ages saw the four creatures, it's like the four gospels. And you all know which gospel is which creature. And it is, like Kyle said, it is emphasizing, that particular gospel is emphasizing that aspect of Jesus' ministry, that he came as man, he came as king, he came as priest or sacrifice, he came from above. Um, it's very, I love it. And Irenaeus apparently is the first time we read this in the Fathers, something that's going to last, like I said, for a thousand years. They're going to use this imagery. Yes? Perhaps um, by coincidence or not, um, John has the uh, nickname the Eagle of Athens. Oh, probably not coincidence. Yeah. Probably because he came to be identified with the eagle. All right, uh, uh, I'm going to just say book five. We're just going to go straight to the one question. That's all we're going to talk about. How are Eve and Mary like mirror images of each other? Somebody yesterday misunderstood me. Mirror images are opposites. Do you know what I mean? The image you see in a mirror is backwards. You know, that's what I meant. Because somebody said, well, they're not the same at all. I'm like, no, that's the point of mirror image. I don't mean they look the same. I meant they're backwards. What did you What did you see? Well, one, they're both visited by an angel. One was backwards and one was fidgets. One was, um, one brought sin into the world and one brought our salvation. Yeah. One said, no, I won't obey. One said, yes. I will obey. Um, here's how Irenaeus puts it. Um, uh, as Eve was seduced by the word of an angel to flee from God, having rebelled against his word, Mary, by the word of an angel, received glad tidings. The former was seduced to disobey God. The latter was persuaded to obey God. As the human race was subjected to death through the act of a virgin, so it was saved by a virgin, and thus the disobedience of one was precisely balanced by the obedience of the other. Then indeed the sin of the first formed man was amended by the chastisement of the first begotten. The wisdom of the serpent conquered by the simplicity of the dove, and the chains were broken by which we were in bondage to death. The enemy would not have been justly conquered unless it had been a man made of woman who conquered him. Um, a woman brought sin into the world. A woman brought the solution for sin into the world. How many of you read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Who, who can be a king or queen in Arnia, and only who? Uh, a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve. Why? Have you read The, last, uh, the Magician's Nephew? Do you know why? <laughs> Who, br who brought sin into Narnia? Diggory, Diggory and Polly. Son of Adam and a daughter of Eve. Brought sin into Narnia. 
in The Magician's Nephew, they brought the white witch. Okay, I'm sorry, I just ruined The Magician's Nephew for you. And so only sons of Adam and daughters of Eve can rule. It's the same. This is why C.S. Lewis did it. This is old. Is it only the son of the woman can undo what the first woman did. And so the church has long seen Eve as the new Mary. Or Mary is the new Eve, I'm sorry. Um, undoing what the first one did by her yes instead of a no. By her obedience instead of rebellion. Um, anyway, it's very cool. All right, I'm sorry. Wait, it's 11.48. Um, so next week we're just reading the next two books of Eusebius because you've finished the early Christian fathers and you're just going to write a descriptive paragraph on that picture I gave you. Say again. Seven and eight. Seven and eight. Yes, and it's in your reading guide. See you next week, guys.